Good morning, I'm John Tucker. And I'm Karen Moscow. Here are the stories we're following today. With Jackson Hole in the rearview mirror, one constant theme emerged. The world's top central bankers stressed the need to keep interest rates high until inflation is contained. Here's Fed Chair Jay Powell. We are prepared to raise rates further if appropriate and intend to hold policy at a restrictive level until we are confident that inflation is moving sustainably down toward our objective. Well, like Jay Powell, the European Central Bank's Christine Lagarde in an exclusive interview at Bloomberg's Tom Keen says the goal is to bring inflation back to its goal. It's critically important that inflation expectations remain anchored at 2%. If trade unions and business associations appreciate that in relatively short order, inflation will be back to 2%, they will not want to fuel more inflation by having wage or or, or margin increases that would not be consistent with that. Both Christine Lagarde's ECB and Fed make uh, policy decisions next month. Well, John, both central banks will have a lot of data to digest before those decisions. The first big one in the U.S. comes on Friday with the August jobs report, and we get a preview from Bloomberg's Vinny Dal Judice. U.S. job growth probably slowed in August as the shutdown of yellow freight lines led to the end of thousands of jobs. At the same time, Bloomberg Economics has temporary jobs supporting concerts and movies. Taylor Swift, Barbie and Oppenheimer probably provided a cushion. The report is set for Friday. Also on this week's data agenda, ISM figures on American manufacturing, which will probably signal more weakness. Vinny Del Judice, Bloomberg Daybreak. All right, thanks, Vinny. In addition to the jobs report, we get some more earnings this week. Let's get a preview from Bloomberg's Charlie Pellet. We will hear from a number of tech companies this week amid a buzz around artificial intelligence and concern about higher interest rates. Diana Amoa is Chief Investment Officer for Long Base Strategies at Kirkuswald Asset Management. So I think what's been supporting equities, despite the higher rates that we're seeing, is actually the earnings. Um, I think this last earnings season especially surprised. We've seen significant revisions in some of the key sectors that are big components of the indices, such as in the tech sector. Among the tech names reporting this week, CrowdStrike, Dell Technologies, HP, VMware, and Salesforce. In New York, Charlie Pellet, Bloomberg Daybreak. All right, Charlie, thanks. Well, in Asia, after initially surging more than 5%, Chinese stocks paired most of their early gains to end the session up just over 1%. Beijing's recent efforts to boost markets are falling flat in the face of economic worries. Bloomberg's Joanne Wong has more from Hong Kong. China's Ministry of Finance said it'll have the one-tenth of one percent levy as of today. The nation has also pledged to slow the pace of initial public offerings. That's among a slew of new measures to woo investors back to its flagging equities market. Regulators have also cut handling fees on stock transactions. They brought up mutual fund managers to increase purchases of their own equity funds and encouraged companies to do more share buybacks. And Bloomberg's Joanne Wong says Chinese authorities have asked some mutual funds to avoid selling equities on a net basis. And more proof this morning global investors have little confidence that China will succeed in shoring up its financial markets. There's a new poll of investors by Bloomberg. It predicts that mounting economic stress will drive the yuan's offshore exchange rate to historic lows. According to the latest Markets Live Pulse survey, the yuan is seen depreciating to 7.6 per dollar before the end of the year. That would be about a 4% drop from the current levels. Meanwhile, John, U.S. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo is visiting China. She stressed the importance of stable economic ties between the world's biggest economies. It's a complicated relationship. It's a challenging relationship. We will, of course, disagree on certain issues. But I believe that we can make progress if we are direct, open, and practical. And Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo is the fourth high-profile U.S. official to visit China in the past three months. And in corporate news, Karen Malincrod has gone bankrupt for the second time in less than three years. Under a proposed restructuring deal, the 156-year-old company plans to give opioid victims a final $250 million one-time payment, a move that would leave them with a billion dollars less than they were promised just last year. Mallinckrodt first went bankrupt in 2020, overwhelmed by costly litigation tied to its role in the opioid crisis. And 3M has tentatively agreed to pay more than $5.5 billion to resolve lawsuits over military earplugs. We get more from Bloomberg's Doug Krisner. 
We're told the settlement stems from over 300,000 lawsuits. They claim the earplugs were defective over a 12-year period starting in 2003. Current and former service members allege 3M knew its earplugs were too short to work effectively. The company was also accused of failing to warn the U.S. government or users and of failing to take steps to fix the product. The sum is about half the roughly $10 billion some financial analysts predicted 3M could end up paying. In New York, I'm Doug Krisner. Bloomberg Daybreak. Thanks, Kara. 507 on Wall Street Time. Now for a look at some of the other stories making news in New York and around the world. And for that, we're joined by Bloomberg's Michael Barr. Michael, good morning. Good morning, John. Friends and family in Jacksonville, Florida, are grieving as a community after a racially motivated shooting by a white man who killed three black people inside a Dollar General store on Saturday before taking his own life. At a community vigil yesterday, pastors offered prayers for healing to help Jacksonville push past this tragedy. Sheriff T.K. Waters says the tragedy will not define Jacksonville. One evil man who decides to take his hateful rhetoric and his hateful thoughts and put those into action, they cannot shake our resolve, and we will not allow it to do so. Jacksonville Mayor Donna Deegan. The division has to stop. The hate has to stop. The rhetoric has to stop. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis canceled today a presidential campaign appearances to deal with Jacksonville and prepares for what is expected to be a hurricane to hit the state this week. Tropical Storm Idalia is now forecast to become a hurricane by late Tuesday afternoon, possibly hitting Florida's Big Bend region as a Category 2 on Wednesday. Right now, Dalia is near the coast of Cuba on a potential track to come ashore as a hurricane in the southern U.S. It is more than 100 miles off the western tip of Cuba, with maximum sustained winds of 60 miles per hour. Governor Ron DeSantis in Tallahassee is warning people in its path to prepare for power outages and possibly more. We have mobilized 1,100 National Guardsmen, and they have at their disposal 2,400 high-water vehicles, as well as 12 aircraft that can be used for rescue and recovery efforts. Governor DeSantis says power companies will start pre-staging linemen today. Military investigators are trying to find out what caused an Osprey aircraft crash on Melville Island in Australia Sunday, killing three Marines. Five more U.S. troops of the 20 three on board were injured and are hospitalized in serious condition. Dozens of heated demonstrators were in front of Gracie Mansion over the migrant crisis in New York City. Protesters and counter demonstrators clashed. At one point, it got physical and the NYPD had to step in to separate both sides. Bus loads of asylum seekers continue to come into the city daily. Mayor Adams says New York has run out of beds and money. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts over 120 countries. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg, John. Michael, thank you. And time now for our Bloomberg Sports Update. And for that, let's bring in John Stasher. John, good morning. All right, good morning, John. It is opening day at the U.S. Open. Flushing men of the women's top seed, Iga Sriantek, plays the first match at Ash Stadium, followed by Francis Tiafo. He made that great run of the semifinals last year before he fell in five sets to the eventual champ, Carlos Alcaraz. Tiafo seeded 10th. Fellow American Taylor Fritz seeded 9th. He plays this afternoon at Armstrong Stadium. Novak Djokovic and Coco Goff both play tonight. Goff comes to the Open, having won won her last two tournaments. Victor Hovland, the 24-year-old Norwegian, won the Tour Championship in Atlanta going away by five shots. He won the FedEx Cup and the $18 million bonus. Yankees in Tampa had a 4-2 lead, then lost to the Rays 7-4. Yanks hit three home runs but had only one other hit, and they have now failed to win any of their last 10 series. They'll start one tonight in Detroit. The Mets home for Texas. They salvaged one with the Angels at City Field. Scored bottom of the ninth to win 3-2. to two. The X-Men, Noah Syndergaard, released by Cleveland. He had earlier been with the Dodgers. He was 2-6 and six with a 6.5 ERA. High drama in Williamsport, Pennsylvania. Finals of the Little League World Series. Curacao tied the game with a grand slam in the fifth inning, so it was 5-5. to five. El Segundo, California, then up bottom of the sixth. See Simone Biles won the U.S. Gymnastics Championship for the eighth time. John Stash Howard, Bloomberg Sports. 
From coast to coast, from New York to San Francisco, Boston to Washington, D.C., nationwide on Sirius XM, the Bloomberg Business App, and Bloomberg.com. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. And good morning. I'm John Tucker. Uh, equity futures, again, edging higher this morning. Stocks rose and Treasury yields jumped on Friday. That came after Fed Chair Jerome Powell stuck to the script in his Jackson Hole speech, saying that the Fed is prepared to raise rates further if appropriate. Right now, let's get you set up for the trading day ahead with economist Dennis Garman, chair of the University of Akron Endowment Committee. Always a pleasure, Dennis. Did the, uh, the meeting of the central bankers in Jackson Hole in any way alter your outlook for markets? Not, not really, John. It was very boring, to be quite honest. And the only, the only comment I would make is that to Chairman Powell, rather than saying higher for longer, said high for longer. No big deal. The fact that uh, we will probably see one last uh, increase in the in the overnight Fed funds rate. Maybe it'll happen at the September meeting. They might take the overnight Fed funds rate another 25 basis points higher in September. If not September, then November. But I think we're probably done with raising the overnight Fed funds rate. However, it shall be a long period of time before they re- begin the process of easing monetary policy, at least well into 2024 maybe into 2025 before we see the, the, the Fed change its direction of policy. So it's, it's high for longer, not higher for longer. That's, that's probably the biggest thing that I can say about the, the, FO, the, the meeting last week in Jackson Hole. Will this rate regime lead to a sell-off in stocks? What does it do for the equity markets? I think stocks have been overpriced for six months. It's been, to me, an, ex- an egregiously overpriced stock market. Uh, we got the, the CNN fear and, greed, fear and Greed Index got to a high of 85, which is uh, characteristically, that's when the markets begin to turn down. That's when the public has been too, too egregiously involved, too abundantly long. And that turned lower about uh, five weeks ago. We had uh, technically an unusual circumstance midweek last week when we opened higher on the, the, on the uh, NVIDIA, excuse me, <coughs> on the NVIDIA earnings, and then you close lower upon the day. And well, let me let me just uh, uh, just interrupt there. After we got those blowout numbers uh, from yeah. NVIDIA, there wasn't the, the rally that some had expected to lift all boats, if you would. Does that indicate some degree of fatigue on the part of equity investors? Exactly. That's exactly what happened. The fact that you had blowout earnings, you opened the market demonstrably higher and closed lower upon the day, that's a very rare circumstance called an outside reversal day. I tend to pay attention to few uh, technical circumstances other than the reversal days. They're very rare. They're very t- meaningful. They're very telling, and they, they happen very infrequently. And when they do, uh, you should pay attention to them. The other thing that I find interesting is that uh, we tend to go down on big volume and up on lighter volume, which is also indicative of a market that's overextended to the upside and due for correction. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in the school of thought that thinks that stock prices are, are going to go at least 5 to 10 percent lower from recent highs, maybe even a little bit lower than that over the, over the next uh, three to four to five to six months. What is your cash uh, position right now for uh, the University of Akron Endowment? We raised, uh, about a year and a half ago, we raised uh, one year's worth of spending, took it out of the stock market, which is about 8% of our portfolio, which turned out to be a, a, a very wise and, and, let's be blunt, a lucky decision because we, we sold the market two days from the highs, which is nothing other than un, uh, unintended and, and uh, glamorous luck. But we got very fortunate, and we're continuing to hold that two years' worth of spending on the sidelines. We, as, a, as a, an endowment, we have to keep a, 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 a certain amount, a, an abundant amount of position in the stock market. But to reduce it by two years' worth of spending is, is by most standards, a, a very aggressive position. So we're comfortable with that position, and we're holding a fair amount of cash, a lot of two-year notes, a lot of uh, tips and a reduced amount of, uh, of equities, but that's been the year and a half to two years that we've made that decision. To return to monetary policy for a moment, yeah. uh, the 2% target, that almost sounds like it, somebody found that on their secret decoder ring. Where does that come <laughs> from? Does that change? I think it doesn't change. I think that uh, the, Mr. Powell has made it abundantly clear that it's not. It's going to be 2%, and he's going to have to hit the 2% number, not 2.9, not 2.8, not 2.7, but 2.0. It's going to be a, a long period of time before we get there. We see 
commodity prices have been under some pressure. Wheat prices, corn prices, soybean prices have been under pressure. Cotton prices have been under pressure. About the only area of the commodity markets that have been uh, to the upside in recent months have been the crude oil prices, which the public pays a great good deal of attention to. But the, uh, the inflationary numbers have been uh, demonstrably less than people had anticipated, demonstrably less than the market had thought likely. And uh, 2% 2 inflation is is the target. They're going to get there. It's just a matter of time. You're listening to Bloomberg Daybreak Today, your morning brief on the stories making news from Wall Street to Washington and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed at 6 a.m. Eastern each morning on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning starting at 5 a.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM Channel 119, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm John Tucker. And I'm Karen Moscow. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak.